With that said, we are going to finish Matthew chapter 28 this week. We're going to be Matthew 28 verses 16 through 20. We began our study of Matthew on Sunday, April 24th, 2022. I did one of those. How old are you calculators? Uh, it's now one year, eight months, I think seven or eight days later, we're going to complete it. It's pretty cool. You know, it's an interesting teaching expositionally. Expositionally is a different way of teaching. Topical, topical teaching is, I tell you what I want to talk to you about. Expositional teaching is, you let the text determine what, is, what the subject is. And as I teach expositionally, that's, that's how I teach. In teaching this way, I'm simply seeking to relay what the word says and what it means by what it says and deliver that to you and let God deal the application in your hearts and the implication of that. And in doing that, there's always a tension between getting into the weeds and going deep to mine the gold. Any teacher knows this, Uh, you know, because you know a lot of stuff as you study. You, you kind of get a, a breadth of understanding that everybody doesn't necessarily need to know, but without experience, you don't know what to communicate, what not to communicate. Does that make sense? Sometimes it takes a little bit of teaching to learn how to teach. And so when you haven't had much experience teaching the word of God, it's hard to discern the difference between what are the weeds and what are the gold. And let me say that the word is always gold. I just want to put that at the word is always gold. And if there's any weeds, that's my fault. Um, but I'm prone to get us out of the mine and into the mire, so to speak, uh, at times into the swamp at times. And so rabbit trails become trails sometimes. And in looking back over the years, especially my early years, I've taken you down a lot of those rabbit trails. If you ever listen to your earlier, I mean, I mean, how many of you sitting there listen to yourself? People don't do that, but I have to, I have to go back and critique what I do and listen to how I say things and all that kind of stuff to to improve. Right. And say, Lord, well, that was off. That was weird. That could have been said better like I'm doing right now. Anyways, (laughs) but graciously God has given me grace with you to learn as I've gone over the years. And, and, and knowing that it was my aim that when we began Matthew, having had several books behind my belt and all that kind of stuff, uh, to, to, to make the text, the main thing to let the main thing be the main thing to just let Matthew teach itself and, and not minor on the minors, but major on the major majors. That was, that was my aim. And having said that there were Sundays we covered, uh, what I would call a lot of ground. And so two or three verses, um, no, several verses, like even whole chapter once, I think, uh, But then there were Sundays we went at a snail's pace. It's kind of like those two words I was using last week in Greek. Uh, They both mean to see it's, but one means to like to look and one means to inspect two different words, but kind of the same uh, two different meanings of the same word. And so there were times when it was just time to see what the Lord was saying, but then there were times to really see what God was saying. And that was determined by a whole lot of factors as we went along. Um, Where was the church? You know, I'm praying for you guys before I I teach. Where are you guys? I've been meeting with you, talking with you throughout the week, finding out what you've been going through. What's going on with you? Where are we? What's the heartbeat of the church? Was there something about Jesus that we needed to understand as a group? or several people in here needed to understand. I never try to preach to a person. Never, never. That's an individual thing. But is there something that we needed to hear? Something I needed to grow in even to understand more fully. Was there something about Jesus that was repeated over and over in Matthew and having read the whole thing, I knew I didn't need to beat it to death. The first chapter I could just, we would learn it as we went. And so you didn't need to go as deep as you needed to go uh, as one could. What was the spirit leading on that Sunday and so forth? All these things were factors. I admit sometimes we looked a little too long, but whether we were looking or whether we were inspecting, we were looking at Jesus together. And I love that. We're looking into, into him 
to his character and to his glory, the way he thinks, the way that he's put things to us, the way he wrote it down, the way he wants to communicate himself. That's what we were looking into. We're looking into him. And I sense that for better, for worse there and how we went about it. We, we grew over the last two years and in, in our knowledge of him. I feel like we all know a lot more about Jesus. We know a lot, a lot more about God. We know a lot, a lot more about his character, even how he arranges things in the order of stuff. And that is not a bad thing. People poo poo knowledge. That is a great thing. The Bible talks a lot about increasing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, but that knowledge has to lead to obedience. And that's what I've seen us grow in is as we know who he is, we've risen to the call of what he's shown us about himself. And we've stepped out in obedience. And that was demonstrated in love. If it's not demonstrated in love, it's like a banging gong, the Bible says. And that love was demonstrated. Fred Sweet, thanks a lot for the tear factor <laughs> by the people I just mentioned. Not up here, out there, loving, learning about Jesus saying yes, Lord, and just living their lives to bless him by blessing you. And that's how, you know, you're on the right path is you're growing in love and not a weird love in his love. And I've been seeing you do that. And I've been growing in that. And let me say, that's the aim of our time in the word together is to grow in the knowledge of him so that we might follow his example that he laid down his life that others might live. <laughs> so with that said, it's been a joy to be in the gospel of Matthew with you. Thank you for traveling and traversing with me over the plat the past year and a half or a year, and eight months. Sorry, I didn't want to cut you short. And so let's finish what we've begun. Four verses left. Matthew 18, 16 through 20. I will read them so we can officially say we're done. This is what is known as the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 16 through 20, that is. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some doubted and Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the father and in, of the son and of the Holy spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And there is the gospel of Matthew and where it closes. Lord, we pray that as we look at these final few verses here in your precious word, that our hearts would be reignited. It's only a work you can do. And we ask for your grace now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, just to give you a quick context to when Jesus is appearing to his disciples, here in Galilee. First of all, we know that according to Acts chapter one, verse three, that Jesus appeared many times and talked about the kingdom of God to his disciples and to others, uh, basically over the 40 days between when he died and when he ascended or 40 days between that time. Um, and we have 10 of those on record. We have 10 of those on record in the gospels and in Acts. So 10 of those are recorded. And, and if you read the gospels enough and you read Acts and you kind of get familiar with everything, you can begin to build the timeline and paste them all together. And that's very helpful and fun. Again, weeds. Uh, but thanks to the apostle Paul writing in first Corinthians 15, three through eight, he gives us a very short synopsis. He just goes, okay, this is the gist of it. He's talking about something else, but he just gives us the gist of it. And so let me read that for you. First Corinthians 15, three through eight regarding the appearances of Jesus 
Paul said, for I delivered to you, that's the church of Corinth, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according with scriptures of the gospel. I've given you the gospel. And that he appeared, here's the timeline, verse 5, to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the 12, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of them who are still alive, and though some have fallen asleep, that is, some of them are dead. Some of them are alive. And then he appeared to James. That's the half brother, Jesus, then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely board, he, he, he appeared to me. So Paul just gives this real quick timeline, a rough timeline of the appearances of Jesus. Now you and I both know that this is not a full timeline because who did he appear to first? It says Peter here, but who did he appear to first? Mary Magdalene, right? And then he appeared to the other women, right? And Mary Magdalene went and told Peter and and John, and they're kind of like, well, maybe. And then they ran to the tomb. And then the other ladies met Jesus. And then he told the other disciples who weren't with Peter and John. And what did they do? They said, whatever, ladies. No, he was dead. Don't you know that? And so they didn't believe, right? But who did God appoint to be the witnesses of his resurrection. The 11 guys who failed big time. Yeah. Those guys are brothers, the apostles. And so that's what Paul is zeroing in on. Not all the other stuff. He's zeroing in on the fact that this is the order in which the apostles saw the risen Jesus Christ. That's the point. And so speaking of appearances, Paul says he first appeared to Peter. Then later that night to the 12. Now, you know, Judas is gone. That means Matthias, the one who ever took over for Judas was in the room in order to be an apostle. There's criteria. And I don't want to go to the criteria of the apostleship, but one is you had to be a witness of his resurrection. Matthias must've been in that room. That's why he calls the 12. Cause this is being written later. Then it says that Jesus appeared to more than 500, Paul says. And many believe that the appearing of 500, Matt, where are you going? Many of the 500 here is what takes place in Galilee in the north, which we're reading about right now. So it might be that this teaching of Jesus here at the end of Matthew is when Jesus appeared to more than 500 of his followers. And that would make sense because in verse 17, it says, and when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And so this being a larger gathering of 500, if that's what's happening here in the North would explain the fact that some doubted as Jesus has already appeared to the eleven. He's already made himself known to them. He's already just recently in John 21, been on the shore with Peter and the boys, six of them. And he's restored Peter. All that's happened. The the, the issue with Thomas and touch my hand, my sides and all that stuff that's already happened. And so it's not the 11 that are doubting anymore. It's others as the disciples first did as well. Right. Right. (laughs) <laughs> Let's not forget that. And so, but it's interesting to the reaction that everybody had to seeing the risen Jesus. What does it say? Two reactions. What does it say? Worship and doubt. Those are the two reactions to Jesus Christ. You either worship him or you doubt him. Those are the reactions. Most worshiped when they saw him, but some doubted. Before you get on these believers, remember who doubted first. Thomas, Peter, James, John, all the boys, right? And they eventually came around as Jesus encouraged their faith. I have no doubt the Lord is long suffering with this group as well. But keep those responses in mind. Belief and unbelief. Belief resulting in worship and unbelief resulting in a lack of worship. Keep that in mind. So Jesus has at least the 11 gathered there. I believe everybody else. And now he's giving them the mission before he leaves. He's not going to leave yet. He's going to leave from Jerusalem. There's a different story there, but the mission 
is to go and make disciples. I want you to go into all nations, go into the world basically and make disciples of all nations. That is the mission that Jesus gives him. And I'm going to explain that further, but it's important to know that the mission is going to be daunting. The mission is going to be difficult. The mission is going to be dangerous. It's going to be disruptive. It's going to be diametrically opposed to the flow of the world. A lot of D's there. Yeah. Woo. I've got three R's coming for you. So don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm growing. And because of all that, because of how difficult it's going to be, what Jesus is going to ask them to do, not ask them, command them to do. He has commanded them. They have to undertake this in faith. That's the only way it works to have to accomplish this in faith. And so just Jesus begins by focusing them and us upon his authority. And by the way, this is how most of the epistles start. They start with who God is and what you do as a result of that. It's a good thing to know when you're reading your Bible, this is who God is. And this is what he's asking you to do. This is who you are in response to that. And so Jesus, verse 18, is focusing them on the realization of his authority. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. If you're taking notes, which you are, the first thing that the Lord calls us to how he calls us to go and accomplish the great commission. The great mission is that he had charged us to recognize his authority R recognize his authority. Write it down, please recognize his authority. If you don't get point one, you're not going to proceed to point two in real life. This is how you proceed. You recognize his authority. The disciples needed to recognize the authority of the one sending them. And so do we, so do I, so do you. Amen. And so they were being authorized. We have been authorized. You have been authorized by Jesus Christ to go and make disciples of every nation, of every tongue, tribe, and nation. That is what you have been called to do. That is your mission. I don't know if I have a life mission. You do now. This is it. Look, Phil, you don't need to worry about it. It's already been done for you. The form is filled out. This is your life mission. My life mission is to go into all the world and make disciples. Now, it was important for the disciples to know that with certainty, his authority. It's important for the church to know the authority with which we are being sent his authority. It's important for you to know the authority of the one who's sending you. The authority that is behind the charge. It's not a weak authority. It's not a limited authority. It's not a powerless authority. It's the authority of God almighty. And Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I'm very learned, as you know, and I've been studying Greek forever. And there's a word called all in the Greek. And guess what it means in English? All. <laughs> Lord made it real simple for me. So low hanging fruit, all is all bro. (laughs) This means that the risen Jesus Christ has all authority. There's none higher than Jesus Christ. Do you recognize that? That word recognize is a loaded word. Isn't it? Kind of has... Yeah, I realize it, but do you recognize it? Do you believe it so? G- 
Jesus is not an authority. Jesus is not, he does not hold four out of the five pieces of pie of authority. His authority is not limited to heaven. It's just up there. His authority is not just, is not limited to earth. It's just down here. He possesses all authority. All of it. In heaven and on earth. Seen and unseen. Spiritual flesh. All of it. Forces. Laws of nature. Everything. All authority is his. Everywhere. Just some supporting verses. Ephesians 121 says that Jesus is far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age to come, but in the one to come. Just in case you're wondering if there's an expiration date on his authority. No, there isn't. It's all encompassing for all time. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. There it is, heaven and earth, the under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the father. Colossians 2.10 says, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. You ever trying to find someone in charge? Who's in charge here? And everybody points to everybody else. Says, I don't know. You just fill out this form and it goes into the ether or whatever it is. He's it. I'm not saying it, don't go to the store and go, Hey, I want to talk to God that you're going to you have issues, but he, oh, he's the ultimate authority. First Peter three 22 says that Jesus, that he has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities and powers having been subjected to him. Remember, this is the glory that he held with the father before the world began. And he gave that up to come down and become a servant. And because he humbled himself, Philippians 2, Colossians, Hebrews 1, all those things. He, God has lifted him above all names. He is above every power, every authority, every dominion, every demon, every angel, every, everything that exists. He's, he's above it all. He has all authority. Jesus prayed in John 17, one through three. He talked about, Hey, you've given me, I have the authority to give eternal life to all flesh. I have the power of life in my hands to give it to anyone. All authority. Do you understand the idea there? I keep hitting it with a hammer there, but that the one authorizing this mission is supreme. And Jesus wants his people to know first his authority. And he is authorizing us to override the authority of the enemy. I'm sending you as my representative. I have power over this world, go and take it back. That's what he's calling us to do. And this is not a lock and load taking it back. This is a kingdom taking it back. If my servants were of my world, uh, of this world, if they were that kind of kingdom, we would take swords and we'd go do things. That's not my kingdom. a different kind of king of a king of truth. My messengers are messengers of truth and they're going to pierce the darkness of lies of the enemy and his kingdom with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The light will break through the darkness. I have authorized you to go in and take what is mine. That's what he's doing. He wants us to trust in that authority, to recognize it, to trust in him, to yield to his authority, to fully lean into his authority. Because if we don't, we're not going to do anything. We can't do anything. We're not strong enough. 
But if we realize the one who has commissioned us and called us is all powerful. And he says, you son, you daughter, you go, then guess what? Oh, but Lord, you don't understand what the policy is at work. Uh, All authority override go. But I'm going to disrupt things. If I start sharing the gospel with that person, you lead when I, when I call you to go lead and share you, you lead and share. Don't worry about all that. You follow me. Oh, we don't want to do that kind of Christianity. We don't want to be disruptive. We don't want to actually Anybody feel that inside? But listen, Jesus Christ just rose from the dead. He says, all authority is mine. Now go. I want you to go into those circumstances, go into their lives, go into the workplace, go wherever I send you, where I've called you, where I've put you and you extend my kingdom. But I'll get persecuted. Oh, really? How much so? Will they Nail you to a cross because you love him that much? Could be. But he wants us to trust his authority, to yield to it. And when we first recognize who he is, he's risen with all authority on heaven and earth. When we, we have to then do something when we recognize it, we have to obey him. What he's commanding us to do as a church. Verse 18 and 19, Jesus came to him and said, all authority in heaven has been given to me. So we must recognize this authority, but then we must second point respond. Respond to his authority. All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, therefore, why is therefore, therefore? Because he has authority. Because I have authority, Go. That's what he's saying. Because I'm in charge, go. Because I've got it, go. That's the command, go. So right now in our hearts, you have to decide, am I going to obey the Lord or am I not? Do I recognize his authority? I might say I do, but do I? the way you show you recognize this authority is through obedience. We go. Jesus was calling these people to obedient action. He was calling them to go. And this is where faith is proven. This is what James talked about. Faith without works is dead. This is how it's proven out. There must be a response to Jesus' command. And so I have a strong suspicion that most of the people on the hill who were worshipers when they saw the Lord, they went. Most. And I have a strong suspicion that most of the people who were doubters didn't. That's just start that up for Matt's thoughts because that's how it works in my life. Church, the authority has not changed. He is King of Kings. He is Lord of Lords. He is head of the church. He's head of this church. We are his sheep. This is his word. I'm the guy reading the script on just what he says. This is our King talking to us. CCF believers go all authority has been given to me. Go. It has not changed. You've got to go. If you love me, you're going to go. Do you love me? This is how, this is God's love language. You ever heard those books? Love language. Is how we talk. Well, here's God's love language, obedience. You can't get around it. This is John 15 stuff. 
But if we recognize his authority, if we love him, we must respond by saying, yes, Lord, here am I, send me. That's the response. And notice he told them about the mission in verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. The mission is to make disciples. What is a disciple? I'm so glad you asked. Well, it's defined in the rest of the verses. I'll just read it real quickly. Baptizing them in the name of the father and the son and the Holy spirit and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. So a disciple is one who's baptized into the triune God. And number two, and by the way, that means to be born again. That's, that's code for born again. I'll go into it in just a second. And secondly, it's one who obeys Jesus. You're born again and you're following him. That's what a disciple is, is it not? That's what a disciple is. That's what all that means. One who is obeying Jesus. You know, we are to go and make disciples. Listen, the mission of the church is not to be a political force. The mission of the church is not to be a political force. When you see churches that are being a political force, that is what they're doing. They're off mission. The mission of the church is not social justice. The mission of the church is not to make America great again. Some of you are chuckling. It's not environmental stewardship. It's not to eradicate world hunger. That's not the mission of the church. That's not what our main mission is. You can't find any of that in the new Testament. Can't find it. And I could fill in the blank with many other causes and convictions, some noble, some not that have muddied the mission of the church. I hope I like not losing you and that you're struggling with this through me. I'm not saying that there aren't elements of good things that we shouldn't be about. That's not what I'm saying, but that's not the mission of the church. Does that make sense? That's not the focus of what Jesus Christ said the church is to be about. There might be a byproduct in there of some of those things. Please don't get me down a road on all this weird stuff. Oh, he said we'd make America great again, or this is that. I'm not. The mission of the church is clear. Go into all the world and make disciples. I want you to win people to me by preaching the gospel and teach them how to obey me. That's it. We don't need to be cute. He's so much smarter than us. He knows so much more about how the church works. You know, when we came to the COVID section of, of our event a few years back and it kind of got to the place where they were just like saying, okay, I want you to put a mask on a trumpet and you know, you've got to have a plexiglass and, and the church can't sing and you cannot gather and all this stuff. It kind of came to a place and my heart was said, you know what? You just don't know what the church is supposed to do. I understand how COVID works and people dying and all that stuff, but Jesus just knows a little bit more than everything else. We are meant to be together. We're going to be together because he said to be together. We're going to sing because he said to sing. It's not out of rebellion. It's out of obedience. We're going to be together because that's the life heart of the church. We need to be together. And yes, we're going to do that in love and responsibly and all that kind of stuff. But I'm just saying he just knows so much better than us. We don't need to get cute. We just need to obey him in this. The mission of the church is to go and make disciples to help us to understand real quickly of the the nature of a disciple. The word disciple has in it with a word that we all love. What's it called? Disciple sounds like the word discipline. Wonderful. How many of you raise your hand? Love that word. Woo. (laughs) The idea is that it's someone who is willful, whose life is willfully submitted to the authority of Jesus. The picture Jesus gives to describe the kind of disciples that we're to be about making is in the imagery of baptism and, and obedience. Those two things. Jesus says, go and make disciples, baptizing them into the name of the father, the son, the spirit, baptizing them into the Lord, into the kingdom. 
What does that mean? Listen, Jesus is not concerned about making sure that you get dunked. The physical act of putting you in the water and lifting you up, that is important. I don't want to dismiss that, but that's, you're missing that if you think that's, that's the picture. That's not the whole enchilada there. Baptism actually represents something. Baptism represents new life. It, it represents rebirth. It represents a change. It means the old life ruled by the flesh is gone. And the new life ruled by the spirit has, ar- has arisen. New life being born again. It's I no longer live, but it now Christ who lives in me. And by now, by my new life is by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's what baptism is. It's a picture of regeneration, new life. John said, don't worry about the one who is going to bap, you know, who, I'm me, I'm baptizing with water. Worry about the one who can baptize you with the Holy spirit and with fire. What does he mean? Either eternal life or eternal judgment. Worry about that guy. Worry about Jesus Christ. And that's what he's saying. Go and preach the gospel so that people receive me, become born again, baptize them as a symbol that the inward reality has already happened. That's what baptism is. We're baptized into the kingdom by the spirit of God. And when we're baptized by the spirit of God, we're new creatures. That's an amazing thing. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. You now have a new father. You have a new nature. You have a new family. You have a new kingdom. One that will never end. You're baptized into the kingdom. And guess what happens to babies when they're born? They get hungry. They want food. And so God has created you with a desire to have spiritual food. Someone who has been made a disciple, who's received the gospel by the miracle of God, they get hungry. And so they need to be fed. Go and teach them. What do they need? Oh, your best life now. No, you need spiritual food. You need Jesus Christ. You need to learn him and all that he's done for you from the lowest hanging fruit to the highest part of the tree of who he is. And there's no exhaustion of that. You need him. You need to feed on him. And that's what we do in the word. That's why we look and why we look. Because we're looking unto Jesus and has his spirit takes his word and connects with our soul. And we begin to hear his voice and he starts to speak us about who we were and now who we are in him and what we are not to be doing anymore as that's the old life, the underwater life. Now we're in the new life, life of the spirit. This is how I live now. So I'm to put away lying. And now I'm going to be a person who tells the truth. Well, how does that process happen? And we're to teach people moving them from a to B. We're to teach them to no longer steal, to be a taker, but now to be a giver. Does this all make sense? This is discipleship. We grow into maturity and the idea of maturity is not like, Oh, look at them. It's man. They look like Jesus. They kind of reflect this love and purity of character. Don't we all want that in one another? Don't I want to aspire to be that man, to be like him? Don't you want to be like Jesus? Yes. Don't you want to have someone who's truthful and righteous around you, who cares about you, who's suffering, who sacrifices for you, who, who won't speak poorly behind your back, but will lift you up and all those types of things. Who speaks the truth and love yet lays down their life for you and helps you with their car or whatever it is. Don't you want those kind of people around you? That's the church. That's Jesus Christ. Those are people, disciples of God. That's who we are. That's our identity. And Jesus says, go and make more. I've given you all the authority. Go. That's the mission. This is John 15 type stuff, that hunger that happens. Read John 15 later. It's Romans 12, one through two. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We are not to be conformed. We're to be transformed. There's to be a discipleship is a change. It's a life change. And it doesn't just start 
and stop at the prayer. It continues. This is to be our life. And if you're stuck in your walk, it's because there's a disobedience factor or there's a lack of training factor, or there's some kind of, cause he does not mean you just, it's not, he's not meant you to stop growing. When you've become like Jesus, then you've arrived. And if any of you think you are at that state, please come talk to me after the service. You're in the wrong church. <laughs> This is the mission of the church to respond to the authority of the Lord and go and make disciples of all nations. We have to go. How do I do that? Jesus is going to tell his disciples, start in Jerusalem, work your way out. Brothers and sisters, this is not the great option. This is the great commission. Commission means with him, a mission with him. We're called to go. I don't know exactly what this looks like in every situation, but guess what? Guess where we're going as a church this year? This is it. We're going to obey. I'm going to obey. Oh, that's going to be difficult because I'm not. <clears throat> Stop. I'm not either but he is. He loved you enough to come grab you wherever you were. Amen. We have a neat season ahead of us, a really neat season ahead of us church. We've got new building things that are going on. That's wonderful. I love it. I can't wait for it, but you know what? This is where it's at. That could all be gone in a moment. This is where it's at just to obey the Lord. And I pray that place would be filled Pray this place would be filled. What for? So we can say, yay, we filled it. No, because uh, we, we want people to come to know the Lord. He's so good. And guess what? He didn't pick the superstars. He picked you. He picked me for What? You guys, with all your weaknesses, kind of remind you of 11 people. So get ready to obey the Lord and this command, but it's not just going and making disciples. I spoke about what a disciple is. We have to make disciples. Now it's the Lord Jesus who makes them. We know that we don't make anything, but he says, come make them with me. Make sense? Go make them. Preach, teach. Yay, Pastor Matt, you go. Yeah, my job and a lot of people in the job of role in the church, the elders and some others, is to equip you for the work of ministry. Is to equip you. You're the plan. And making disciples involves preaching and teaching. Yes, of course but there's also walking alongside the newborns. There's holding them, loving them, caring for them, crying with them, showing them how to act like Christ day after day, after day, after day, through your character, through your patience, through your long suffering, through your correction, through your love, through your acts of charity and helping them. You know, it's hard to follow Jesus when you can't pay the bills. It's just when you're just underwater. There's a lot of practical things that need to happen. There's a lot of spiritually spiritual things that need to happen. We all are going to work together to make disciples this year. We're going to be stretched. Now, if we look at these verses, Jesus is calling us to do a few things in here. Review. We're done. Recognize his authority. Number one, that means all authority is his. Secondly, respond to his authority. That means we are going to go. I will go. But lastly, rest in his authority. This is huge. Rest in his authority. Last verse, Matthew 28. Behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Rest in him. 
We're to rest in his authority. Church, remember he's with us. He starts with. Yeah, you have authority over heaven and the earth. I recognize that. It goes to now I'm going to go make disciples, Lord. With these brothers and sisters of mine. It goes now to he's with me. He's not doing this alone. (laughs) Don't think you're alone. And if we believe him, there's only one response. Worship. If you don't, like I said in the beginning, then you won't do anything. There's only one response. Worship. Worship and recognition. You are King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I recognize your authority. I worship you for who you are. Worship in response. Here's my life. I lay it down. We're going to go. And worship and rest. Lord, you're with me. And I entrust everything to you. Church 2024 is a, is a mission time. It's our mission year. So that's where we're going. This is, this is the mission. It's not an option. I realize that many of you will become uncomfortable. It's not with a mean spirit. It's purposeful because to disobey the Lord Jesus on such a fundamental level, I'm guilty of what would you do with that guy? Who's in charge of a whole church with some other wonderful elders. Who's in charge of leading them. And we go, Oh Lord. Yeah. But take it seriously. This is his word to us. So let's worship him. Amen. Let's worship him. Pray and ask God what doors he wants to kick down this year, who he wants to bring in to the Lord. And let's step out in boldness and watch God do something awesome. Amen. And I have no idea what we're doing, but let's go. Amen. Lord God, we love you. Thank you for 2023. Thank you for your faithfulness upon this church. Thank you for each one of us, Lord, and how you've blessed us, God, and how your spirit has moved us and filled us and been kind to us. And we ask this year, Lord, that that kindness would not stay within our hearts, Lord, but would explode out into the world around us. That we would love you and love them enough to lose our lives that they might live. Give us wisdom in how we proceed. Give us grace, Lord. Let us come across as the best of the best, God. But nevertheless, we go forward in obedience. We pray this all for your glory and your name's sake, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Lord bless you all. Have a happy new year. I will see you next year. Amen. If you need prayer up here for you.